Hello everyone. Welcome again to one of our little sessions, Tuesday sessions. So it is September and it's after Labor Day and that always means I can't wear my white shoes. <laughs> I know that's not true, but um, it just feels that way to me. I'm thinking about fall and I'm thinking about pants. And so of course I'm thinking about our September project for So Confident which is the Helix Pants in this beautiful Ponte knit. I talked about this knit, I believe, last week in that it's so special because it is mid-weight but feels lightweight. It's drapier than most of the mid-weight Pontes that I've seen. It has a very, very, very subtle sheen to it. I wouldn't call it shiny at all. It's still very matte finished, but it's just a nice, smooth, beautiful, Ponte knit that we are carrying in kits in black, pottery, and steel, and this is the steel color. So I hope you'll join us uh, for either the monthly workshop, which you can sign up for, or of course, if you're a yearly member, you have it. The video released last Friday. I know many of you have watched it because I've heard from you over the weekend. Thank you very much for that. So send us your pictures. We want to see what you're up to. And um, some of you ordered more than one kit, which was quite nice. So thank you for that too. Helix Pants, September. And this is the, the second in the ensemble for fall. It goes really well with the Willow Blouse, which was the September and July projects. And also the jacket that's coming up in October. So, so confident. Always like to start off with that. This month is National Sewing Month, which I really don't keep track of, but I do get notices from Threads Magazine, and they notified me that it's um, National Sewing Month. And you can sign up on their website for all kinds of goodies this month from vendors such as Clover and uh, Batik Fabrics. That's not quite the name of it, uh, but they have, they're giving away over $1,000 worth of gifts and so you can sign up for the Threads National Sewing Month Sweepstakes and it's free to sign up so go on their website and sign up for the sweepstakes and maybe you'll win something or all of it uh, sounds like fun to me I always look forward to the fall fashion issue of the Wall Street Journal so of course I devoured it over the weekend but I was looking for what I would consider fall trends. And frankly, I didn't see anything particularly new about this. Now, it's always fun to look at. and The clothes are out there and things that I'm not going to actually replicate or certainly I'm not going to buy. But it's always interesting to see. But it seems to me like the color theme is something that we've had around for my lifetime, which is black and camel. And the only thing I really picked up on is that it's time to get out your silver shoes. Daytime, evening time, anytime. So I dug out my silver sneakers today and I have them on. They are by P448 and they're the most comfortable shoes that I have. So I just thought, okay, I'm right in. Even though these are several years old, I'm digging them out. So check out the Wall Street Journal fall fashion issue. Now coincidentally today, I got an email from Linda Dickey who gave me a link to some wash that she uses in her laundry. And it's called Glamorous Wash. Well, I'd actually heard of this. And Samantha Plo and Rhonda Gaddy had told me about this product called Glamorous Wash uh, when we were sewing together a while back and I ordered it on Amazon and it really is nice. Uh, you don't use as much as they say to use. I don't use it as my primary detergent. I just add a little bit just for the fragrance, but it does make your fabrics that you pre-wash and of course your laundry, your sheets, whatever, just have that wonderful odor to it. And now my whole sewing room, which is also my laundry room, kind of, sort of, uh, all smell just great. So I recommend it. Uh, it's not particularly expensive, but it lasts a long time because I don't use much more than a cap full of this. Just throw it in the wash with my other detergent and it makes everything smell great. 
All right, so we are introducing a pattern today, a digital pattern. It's not a new pattern. It's actually over 30 years old. But it is the very first pattern that we ever introduced, and it's called the Japanesque top. So the story about the Japanesque is that I bought the sewing workshop school in San Francisco in 1991. And I bought it in something like December, and in January, I got a notice that the American Sewing Guild was going to have their national sewing convention in San Francisco that year. And would I teach? And I went, oh, I guess so. I've never done that before, but uh, sure, why not? And oh, by the way, uh, bring your products, and we have a table for you, and you can set them out, and we'll sell them. And I went, oh, but we have no products. Well, I decided to put something together. So this is a garment that I had been looking at, and I soon kind of realized after buying the school anyway that we kind of needed some products to draw people to San Francisco to take classes because we really were a school first and foremost and only at that time. But to get the word out, I felt like we needed something to attract people to actually travel to San Francisco, a reason to take a class. So we had this garment and we had a pattern, kind of a, you know, maybe one size of a pattern. So I remember copying by hand about 200 of them on big sheets of paper and typing, because I don't think I had a computer then, typing some instructions, no drawings whatsoever, no illustrations, just one, two, three, four, five, and on, 20 steps of sort of kind of how to put this together and put that in a manila envelope and stuck a drawing on the top of that with a glue stick and called that a pattern. Put that on the table at the ASG National Convention and sold 200 of them in a few minutes for $20 a pattern. And I thought, oh, I think maybe this pattern business might be a good thing to pursue. So we ended up getting into the pattern business and of course, after that, we were having them professionally printed by McCall's in Manhattan, Kansas, which is not very far from us. And, and you know, the whole pattern thing exploded for us, and we became then a pattern company that also had a school and also sold some fabric and all of that. That's all really changed over the years. Now we sell a lot of fabric and we sell patterns, but basically we're still in the pattern business. Well, the Japanese top, I think we had three sizes at the time, small, medium, and large. So if you have one of those early patterns, either in the original Manila file folder, I think later we upgraded to white envelope, you know, kind of gave it a new look. And then we printed it in one color, and then we printed it in color. And so that pattern was around for a while, a few years, but you know, it's been gone now for a long time. But I still have people who email me and when they come here, they say, you know, that Japanese top pattern, that's still a good pattern. And I go, oh yeah, yeah, it's great. But we decided to bring back the very first pattern that we ever produced, and I call it a classic, because it really is. So I have it on. I made it yesterday. This is how it looks on the pattern envelope. And if you were to just take the pattern piece out of the old pattern, or now download it as the digital uh, variation of it, this is what it would have. It has some really interesting features to it, I think. Um, it has one button at the neck, so you have a, a different right front and left front. They're shaped differently. You have a tab that comes out of the left side seam and buttons to the bottom of the right piece. There is a, an either a tie, a button, or another tab that you can put that connects the left front to the right side seam. And I like this tie, which is what I did on this one, because that means you can kind of adjust it to how you want it to drape. And pretty full sleeve. And then the back has a yoke. And it's a double yoke, so all the seams are nicely finished. And then it has this great pocket, kind of a bag pocket, so it's loose on the bottom, but it's definitely sewn down, 
so it's secure. And it's just a fun detail that you can put any place. Now this is where the pattern has you put it on the right hip, but it'd be great on the front. It'd be a great pocket to use on any garment. It'd probably be worth buying the pattern just to get this pattern piece and figure out how to make it. But I, I love that uh, look. But you can see that the profile of this is such that it is fairly large at the top through the shoulders and the arms, the sleeve, and then it tapers and depending on how you wear it, uh, you can cinch it in a little bit. It's definitely pegged. I will call it pegged. And um, I just think it has a great shape to it. Now, to wear it like this, you're probably going to want to wear something under it. And I happen to have a mix-it tank on underneath mine. And I like the way I've made it a little bit longer. So it just sticks out so you can have a little bit of contrast and it helps define what's happening at the bottom of this with this asymmetry and the drape of this right front and so forth. So I'm going to show you lots of variations because we have made this garment over and over and over and I think it has a lot of really uh, interesting options of what you can do to it. So Deb just walked upstairs. Let's see what you've got on. You didn't walk upstairs. You brought, probably took the elevator, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. So if you take the right front and cut it twice, and so you have the right front and the left front absolutely the same, and there's just one button and loop at the side seam, and then the tie under there, you have a totally different look. So you're wearing that over a fairly classic blouse little uh, collared blouse and you've let that kind of stick out and then you have something on the sleeve that's also in the instructions which is a button and buttonhole and the buttonhole goes through a couple of layers so that cinches that full sleeve in and you can leave it like this roll it up or you can cinch it in like that so from all of the samples that we had this is the one you chose because of the people. Because of the people. And yep. The colors. And no, we don't have any of these fabrics <laughs> left that I'm going to show you because these are pieces that we've made over the years. But uh, I think this is a nice, you just threw that on this morning. Had you even th tried it on before that? No, I didn't try it on last week. That was. I figured the pants would probably be close enough. Yeah. What pants are those? Oh, those are the Hudson's. Yeah. The with with the, that bottom detail that has the, the two uh, panels on the bottom that wrap. So this was the February So Confident Project, the Hudson Pants with the variation on the bottom. So turn around the back. Uh, even the yoke is gone on this one, so you can delete that. And the pocket's gone. But there's definitely a longer back, shorter front, and this time the right front's been cut twice. So you think you'll make this pattern? Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay, well, great. Even, even Becky was excited about it. Yeah, Becky, who works on uh, in the middle of the week, uh, helps Deb out. She liked it, huh? Yeah, yes. she she was pretty into it. I could, yeah. Yep. All right. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Let's go back to work. All <laughs> right. And then Erin has on one that is made in velvet, and this one is the right front and the left front. But instead of all the tabs and the buttons. This is just buttoned down, fairly straight, actually. A little bit on the diagonal, but not extremely. And it's always too short for Aaron on the, on the sleeves, but um, in velvet, it's just fantastic. We have a uh, tutorial on sewing with velvet, and of course, you can put velvet in your regular uh, wardrobe now when you use the Sulky KK2000 temporary spray adhesive to nail those hems down and seams down so you don't have to fuss with the fabric and pin it and pin it pin it like you normally do. So what's going on in the back of this one? Uh, again, the yoke is gone. You know, when you're working with velvet, you want to eliminate as many seams as possible because, you know, even though it's not as fussy with the KK2000, it's still a little bit. So no pocket on that one either. So that's been simplified and just simply buttoned with some fantastic buttons that have a little bit of gold glitter to them. All right, so that's velvet. We have another one in a burnout velvet that is pretty much made like the one that Erin had on. Well, no, it isn't. This is the one like uh, 
Deb had on, where this time we have two right fronts. So a right front and a right front used as a left front. So it creates this V-neck. But again, buttoned down with three big, bold statement buttons. No pockets, no yoke, and then buttons on the sleeves. But this is a Devereux or Burnout. This is really a fun thing to just wear to dinner or over to someone's house for dinner. Um, cruise wear, we're coming into that sort of season. Um, but you'd wear a tank or something underneath. Well, maybe not. I would. <laughs> All right. So that's velvet and burnout velvet. Here's another one like the original. And this is in a Japanese cotton, so it's a woven texture, but it has all of the elements of just a nice, simple cotton. So this is more casual. And again, you get this nice, crisp look. You get a little bit of drape on this. You know, every fabric's going to drape differently with this uh, variation of it. But here are a couple of nice, pretty buttons. And has the yoke, has the pocket. And so this is something you could wear with jeans, casual pants, simple skirt. Let's see what we've got here. This one has the button. So let me show you this. So whereas this one had the tie that tied the left front into the right side seam, this one actually has the tab, the other tab that can be of any length. It could be long, it can be short. This is the actual pattern piece. And then there's a button that's sewn to the seam allowance right above the vent opening. And you would button that. I don't know if I have that buttoned correctly. Yes. All right. So it draws it in. And I like the way it changes the shape. Now, you could make this without any buttons and any tabs and any ties and all of that and just simply make a nice drapey Whoops, there's a certain way you button this. I'm, I'm learning this again. There it is. So that is in a nice Japanese cotton. I like the way this neckline is straight on one side and curved on the other side. So it has one facing, it has a facing for the left front, but then this is just the front hem. Here is another one made just like the original pattern, this time in a silk georgette. It looks hand painted. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, I remember making this. But I love to see how it drapes so much differently than this cotton one. The cotton one has structure. And this one has a lot of flow and drape to it. This one also has the buttons at the sleeves. This time, no buttonhole. For those of you who cannot stand buttonholes, then you just simply fold over the fabric and sew the button through all the layers. And there's the yoke cut in a different direction, so you really get a nice contrast, and the pocket on the hip. Now, one of my favorites, actually, is to make it into a little jacket and line it. What's going on here? Yeah. So this is again two right fronts, right front, right front as a left, shortened a bit, no tabs, no buttons, no ties, just left open, sleeves are not buttoned, and then it's lined with a gorgeous silk charmeuse. So that just makes a super, super easy garment to make. I'm pretty sure that the yoke is eliminated, yes, and no pocket. So this is something you could put together really quickly. Has a very drop shoulder to it, you have to know that. And it, this is a garment that you're not going to be able to bring that shoulder line completely up. Now you could raise it a little bit, but this is not something that's going to be able to be reshaped into a structured jacket. It's always going to be a drop shouldered piece. But this has the jump at the back in the lining and it has the jump at the bottom as well. So 
no matter how you move, you're going to not have any strain on the fabric. But I think this is really pretty. Might have to get this one out. You know, we have this vault of fabrics or uh, garments and we forget about them. All right, here's another variation of buttoning. Again, no tabs. But this time, it's pairs of buttons, just a nice lightweight linen for summer. I would probably be either rolling up the sleeve, or I think for something like this, you could literally cut off the sleeve, have a shorter sleeve, and have a totally different look to this pattern. This is almost handkerchief weight linen. Again, no pocket, no back yoke. The buttoning is really the feature. I can't. Re there was a reason I did this garment. I think maybe it had something to do with Threads Magazine. Not sure about that. But this is pretty much what you just saw in the handkerchief linen. This is a heavier weight linen with the buttons uh, in, in different places. There's two up here and one down here. But some torn strips of velvet that are raw edged and then I've sewn these down with some decorative stitches in a silver metallic thread. I know this was for a project for something. I just don't quite remember what it was. But I have some of these straight pieces on the right front, on each, or just one sleeve, bottom of the left front, and down the back. So this is a nice piece to embellish. If you are someone who likes to embroider or applique or piece, all of these pieces are shapes of the pattern pieces are so simple and not rectangular, but definitely rectangular-ish. Is that a word? Um, and so they make nice uh, canvases for doing some of your embellishment work that you like to do. This one, I remember who made this. This is made by Dort Johnson who was the woman who got me into all of this. Uh, Dort was um, my mother's age, and she was the town expert on sewing. And I remember she remade some garments for my mother, tore apart some fur coats. Not that my mother had a lot of fur coats. I think she had muskrat and maybe fox. Uh, but she tore them apart and used them as trims on things, so my mother was finally down to this much fur left from some coat that she had uh, after Dort had done like 10 variations over the course of 20 years with fur. But at any rate, she had a fabric store and she was an expert and I didn't know her very well. But I remember I wanted to start a fabric store. This was back in the late 80s. And I took Dort to lunch and I said, I want to start a fabric store. I want to open one. She said, well, can you sew? Well, yeah, I think so. Well, let me see, did you make that? Yes, well, you've got some things to learn, but I'll help you. So she helped me open a fabric store. She taught me almost everything I know about sewing, and she became a great friend and mentor over the years. And so I have some of the garments that she made, and this is one of them. And I just, I love this, because she's put this beautiful, well, it's just a medallion with a, a, a tassel just a thing and there's a snap under here but I think that's a beautiful little piece and then another kind of dressy button but I remember her wearing this uh, this is a knit kind of a Rochelle novelty weave knit it has all the elements to it. it has the yoke has the pocket and she's just simply changed how this buttons left off the tab and so forth but I can still see her in this garment Aaron should be wearing that one. Aaron would look good in that one. This one's made out of some panels of uh, ecot woven silk fabric. And it was at two or three different pieces that actually work together. This looks like a seam, but it's not. This is the same fabric that's just been woven in such a way that this is almost like a border. Uh, we used to buy these kinds of fabrics at the big uh, trade show out in Puyallup, Washington, and there used to be a lot of vendors who would sell fabrics like this. Has the yoke, pocket, 
This is even a, a third fabric as the pocket. And again, buttoned down like this. Now this one, I can tell, has a tapered sleeve. So those are some of the variations in fabric. The one that I have on the dress form is in a uh, jacquard weave cotton. And this is very much like what Deb had on. Again, a right front cut twice with a loop and a button. So it's a chance to use all those buttons that we've collected as singular buttons and you have no idea what you're going to do to them, but it's time to get those out and feature them for a garment like this. But you can see how this has been cinched in with the button in the loop, and then there's a tie on the inside of this. So you have equal drawing in, and that gives the shape to this garment. A yoke, but no pocket. So I think I've shown you almost all the variations that we've thought of, and I know that you guys will come up with even more. So I started in to make this and realized that I wanted to take a little bit of the volume out of the top of this garment. And yet I didn't want to change the hip size. So here's what I did to my pattern. By the way, if you have the original printed pattern, you need to check and see whether you have the pattern that has the small, medium, and large in it or whether you have the pattern that has the expanded sizes from extra small and then we added extra large and XXL as well. So the newest pattern does have the six sizes. That's what's been digitized and as is the download pattern. But some of those older printed patterns only have three sizes. I think because this pattern is of the era that it is, you should be able to go down a size. So I went down one size to an extra small. But I still wanted to take out some of the volume of the sleeve and under the arm. So I did what I'm going to tell you about here on both of the fronts, the right front and the left front and the back. So I decided to take out an inch under the arm and draw a new line that died to the original width at the hip. So I've taken out this much fabric under the arm. Remember, that is both fronts and the back. So I've taken out four inches out of the circumference of this garment across basically the bust area below the sleeve. So then for the sleeve, in order for that to fit, I again reduce the sleeve cap by one inch on both sides so it would fit the new uh, distance of the arm's eye. And then I took a tape measure and decided to make the circumference of the sleeve 10 inches. So 10 inches plus a couple of seam allowances. And because the original sleeve is curved, I kept that curve and use the hip curve to draw a new line. So it has a soft shape to it. I think sleeves are just a little more beautiful when they have a little bit of curve to them. Now you could make that straight, and we certainly have a lot of straight sleeves in our pattern line, but that just defines that a little bit. It's a little more graceful. But you choose the width that you want. If you're not sure about that, you can measure something in your closet that you like the um, circumference of and might be 10 inches, it might be 12 inches, it might be 8 inches. But I decided I did not want the button detail. I wanted a slimmer sleeve all the way. So I've taken out quite a bit out of this sleeve, you know, almost 2 inches of this sleeve circumference and I like it a lot better. The only way to really determine sleeve length is to pin fit this pattern piece pieces on you. Uh, actually determine from standing in the mirror, in front of the mirror, put that front up on you and determine where that ends on your arm so you know how long to measure the sleeve. Otherwise, there's hardly any way to really measure. Now, this is a reduced little drawing that I've made of both of these pattern pieces, but there's no way to just really know where this is until you can measure this based on where the fronts or the back end on your arm. So remember that. 
So that's what I did to the pattern. And then I think that one of, what well, I still need this, I guess. Take this down. So this pocket is really fun. And I think this is a pocket you could use on a lot of things. This is the pocket piece. And there's an upper pocket and an under pocket that has a center fold line. So this hem allowance at the upper pocket actually gets pressed under and top stitched. And this hem allowance on the under pocket gets pressed up to the right side, which just seems weird at the time. And then the pocket gets folded in half, basically with the right sides together first. And then you sew from these dots down. That's what makes that pocket loose. So this bottom half of the pocket is actually loose. And then these seam allowances get turned under and the pocket is sewn to the garment. You actually sew it, the under pocket first on three sides and then you sew the upper pocket just on two sides. So it's a really simple pocket to make. But you know, I, it reminds me that we used to have in our pattern line a lot of these interesting details with po unusual pockets mostly borrowed from Japanese designers such as Isimiyaki. We've gotten away from that just a little bit, but it reminds me that, you know, we should be rethinking some pockets. Uh, I remember uh, one of the teachers at the sewing workshop, Pat Moyes, wrote a whole book on pockets. It may still be around. It's probably not published anymore, but um, you could look for that. And she had fantastic ideas for all the kinds of pockets you could put on things. So that's the pocket. Now, there were some things that I, in the construction of this, that I knew I couldn't live without. There are a lot of hemmed edges, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, in every edge, basically, except for the seams, the side seam and the sleeve seam, are turned, turned again hems. And because this is just long enough ago, we're only turning a quarter of an inch and then the hems are an inch and a quarter wide finished. Well, a quarter of an inch on certain fabrics is a little bit difficult to deal with. But first of all, you just really can't live without your, your pressing templates, both the one and a half, which is the hem allowance, and one and a quarter, which is the finished hem width. So you're turning down an additional quarter of an inch. And I can't do that without pressing the templates. I have repeatedly talked about how to do this on Facebook Live, so I won't repeat it again. But it's clearly written in the instructions of how to put the first one down and get the full hem allowance pressed first. And then you put the smaller template in the crease that you've just made and you press up the quarter of an inch over the bottom of the template. But then immediately, if you don't have Fusy Web, you're going to be sorry. If you've never invested in Fusy Web, this is, I think, a chance for you to do that. Because this is a paper covered line of glue that then I put on the very edge of those uh, turned edges. And that keeps that quarter of an inch folded down. So I don't have to fuss with that as I'm trying to top stitch these hems. This is super essential. But this is really the only way to get nice, even hems. I do use my chalkener and straight edge to mark the top stitching line a little bit. I like to do my top stitching on the top side of the fabric rather than on the, on the underside. I can get, I think, a smoother look because I'm not looking at the edge of the hem. I'm looking at the edge of the garment and uh, sewing an even distance from that. There are, I think, at least five miters on this garment. Something like that. And even though we have instructions for mitering the corners, I think that maybe there are six. Anyway, you get your practice on this with miters. You know, we have our Mastering Miters book, which we're almost out of, by the way. This is sort of the last call, in a way, on a printed ma Mastering Miters book. We're going to be doing this in digital form soon, so we'll always have this. But for the printed version, 
We're just about out of them. So my essential tools, my Mastering Miters book, my hip curve, Chalkener, Fusy Web, Templates, Walking Foot, even Feed Feature, Engaged, whatever, whichever you use most often because you're doing a lot of top stitching and you don't want things to crawl, although they're not going to because you're fusing those hems down, but still, a, 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 a walking foot is, is really essential. All right, any questions? Yes, um, so quite a few people really liked the jacket, the line jacket version. Yeah. Um, could you try that on? Can I try it on? Yes. Sure. So you're gonna make me undress, huh? <laughs> I didn't know if it would slip over. Well, maybe, maybe, yeah, I'll just put it on this. Good idea. <laughs> That's what I was hoping anyways when I yeah. offered it up. Good idea. <laughs> and what is that fabric? Well, this fabric is some sort of a blend, um, kind of a Chanel type uh, woven plaid. So here it is. Mm -hmm. oh, pull the camera back. Long gone fabric. That we used to have a lot more fabrics like this, and it's, we're not seeing these fabrics as much as we used to, but I've always loved this one because of the colors. So, and could you turn around one more time? So sure. I didn't have the camera positioned. And you said this was shorter, right? That's cute. Yes, the, all the pieces are shorter. And the front and the back are essentially cut the same length. Okay, and then I also wanted to see the Dort's version. Can oh, okay. Can put that one on? Yeah. Now, the Dort's version, I think, is bigger by quite a bit. Um, I don't know what size it is, but I think it's a lot bigger. Well, the sleeves are definitely longer. Oh, <laughs> Dort was a tall person. That would have been a good one for me. <laughs> yeah. And the snap. I can still see her in this. She wore it a lot. That looks nice. I do like that longer version. Yeah. I don't know if this is longer or if it's just a bigger size. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I don't really know. It's it's a I have the feeling it's just a bigger size because it, mm -hmm. in the grade of the sizes, it does get longer. It's quite a bit longer with the extra large. I'm right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have the feeling this is probably an extra large. I, I don't know that, but so. And that does bring up kind of a correction. So the, it does go up to extra large and yeah. not extra, extra large. Oh, oh, is that right? Okay. Right. That was with the original or oh, okay. second um, version of the pattern. Okay. <laughs> so we've only, we only have... Um, Extra small. Uh, five sizes. Right. Extra small to extra large. Correct. Yeah. Right. Um, and then the green one behind you, is that, what's that fabric? Oh, this fabric is wool jersey. So it can be made in a knit. This is a knit. And this is a knit. It'd be great in a ponte knit, uh, I think something with a little bit of structure to it. You know, it's really difficult to find wool jerseys now. In fact, I don't think we have one in our inventory at the moment. I don't think so. They're really difficult to find. And if you find them, uh, they're generally in merino wool, which is fine. Uh, but that is the kind of wool jersey that does not shrink when washed. And, you know, that's always the kind of wool jersey that we used to f want to have because we wanted to shrink it and boil it and uh, felt it and all that. But hard to find. Um, so your white um, top underneath. Yeah, this is the mix-it tank. Is that the original length of the tank, or did you yes. lengthen it? No, this is the original length of the tank. This is all the same size. It's just in a crinkle polyester 
something or other. And it's a couple inches, maybe two or three inches longer than the front of the jacket at least. Yeah. Okay. And you know, I've had this tank. I didn't make this tank just for this. It just worked. I put it on and it worked. Can you turn around again so they can see the back? Um, back to the line jacket, um, is the, are the lining instructions and how you made the jacket, is that in the pattern? No. The pattern instructions are if you make it just like this. Uh, unlined, tabs, button placement like this. No. Um, in order to do the line jacket, you would just simply take the right front piece, cut it twice, you would shorten it. You could shorten it at the bottom to whatever length you want, shorten the back to the same length as the front. You would tape the yoke to the back piece, so this is all one. And then uh, we have a tutorial called Bagging the Lining, which shows you how to cut a lining for any garment <clears throat> and how to sew it. So that'd be a good reference, but the, those instructions are not in the guide sheet. And um, the Japanese you're wearing, is that the length of the pattern? This is the length, yeah. I didn't do anything to the length of the extra small for this. But again, I could have used the extra large length on even the extra small size. Um, would you make this into a dress? I think so. Uh, I'd have to think about the buttoning of it as a dress. Um, I'd also have to think about the circumference at the bottom and how to connect that. But I don't know why it wouldn't make a great dress. I think you could also have this literally sewn up as well and not have it buttoned at all. And just have it as one piece, maybe leave a little bit of an opening here so you can get it on. And maybe check the angle at the front, like wherever you want it to hit at the bottom. Right. You might check that. You might have to redraw that angle. Yeah. I think it could be cute. Okay, Samantha, <laughs> the challenge is on. <laughs> Would you choose a smaller size for a knit fabric? No, not necessarily. Uh, this is a garment that is pretty much oversized, generously sized, I think, in... Uh, most knits, you're going to be fine making the same size. I mean, if you're, if you're using some sort of a super drapey tissue weight, something or other, yes, you could probably go down a size. But um, I generally make the same size in a knit or a woven. Um, could you make this in the quilted fabric? In the quilted fabric? In a quilted fabric. Could you Sure. That? That'd make a great jacket. Like cantha? Cantha cloth or the... Um, stitched matelassés that we have, those mm -hmm. Merchant Mills mm -hmm. pieces, that would be nice. Make a great, great jacket. This, I'm getting ready to go on our London textile tour uh, in a couple of weeks, and I put this on, after I put this on, I thought this is the perfect weight to take, so I think this is going to go with me, because I can, I can layer underneath it if it gets cool, and yet I can take this off if I need to. So I think it's a good piece to travel. And what pants are you wearing? I am wearing the famous Picasso pants in the black and white crinkle check seersucker. The whole outfit would be great to take. Yeah, even my silver shoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there was a question um, about you answered it, but um, just to kind of read it, um, the narrowing of the shoulders. What um, can you narrow the shoulders of this? Pattern? Sure, um, you can uh, narrow the shoulders doing the standard uh, way of tracing the arm's eye and setting that over. So you can narrow the shoulders if you want to. You also, on this garment, could probably literally pinch out a little bit too. That's another way to go on this kind of garment. So you can, um, you know, dye that to nothing down at the bottom. 
but don't narrow it too much. But yeah. Um, with the Helix kit, would you recommend initial wash and dry in the machine um, and then further washing and hanging? Of the Helix kits? Mm -hmm. I would definitely wash and dry the fabric before I make the pants. Um, I'm probably not going to wash the pants after that. They're probably going to get dry clean, but yes, if you want to wash them and hang them, that would be fine. And just to confirm, um, Linda, did you go down a size to, and alter the pattern to make it smaller than the extra small? Yes. But just, but not in the hips. I made, I started with the extra small and I took out the inch from the extra small. Okay, that's all I see. Okay, so let's look at some fabrics. So I have on the uh, cotton and linen matelassé that we used for the sterling jacket projects for So Confident in January. Uh, obviously this is the black one. I know that black doesn't necessarily show up on the screen, but I just really wanted a black top and a black jacket, so I made black. So we have the black, we have the olive green in this fabric, and we have the what is this color called? Raisin. Uh, uh, raisin. Raisin color. Very interesting color. And you see the tonal change of the jacquard weave. Uh, this is actually the wrong, well, I don't know. You can use either side of this fabric, but it is different. And I chose to use the side where the, these motifs are the smooth side like this, but you can use either side. There's definitely a texture change. This is more smooth, and this has a little weave to it, the darker part. So, and then we have it in the oatmeal as well. So then, the other jacket fabrics that I think would be fantastic are these crinkle cottons. And here's a, a beautiful burgundy color, olive, and cinnamon, auburn color in that. We also have another jacquard that has a floral pattern to it in this goldenrod color. Again, you could use either side. Depends on whether you want it to speak to you in a darker tone or a lighter tone. And then Erin put together some fabrics, some knit fabrics that you could make the second layer. You could make either the ET, if you want a sleeve and a little higher neck, or you could make the mix-it tank, either one. So here's a beautiful blue, just a great denim blue to wear with so many things, but it could go with the oatmeal. I think it goes with the olive. Or you could stick with your uh, autumn tones and make uh, a more golden color of t-shirt with either the olive or the golden jacquard. This is the rib knit that's a little bit darker, but again, I think this goes with the auburn um, cotton, crinkled cotton, goes with the olive. Everything goes with oatmeal. This is Again, the rib knit in a gray. You know, if you want something a little more subtle, I've chosen to put white under mine, but gray would be great. I love this combination of purple or eggplant with olive. That's a fantastic combination. And then we have the rib knit in this ruby color that goes with either one of these. So those are fabrics that I recommend for combinations for the Japanese top and either the ET or the Mixit tank. So how does the fabric sew? Is it an easy fabric to this sew? This is an easy, this was a super easy fabric to sew. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have any problems sewing it whatsoever. It wants to stay in place, particularly with that fusy web. Uh, it steams nicely. I didn't get any ripples with it. Um, 
I've done other projects in the crinkled cotton. I did a Zen jacket that I just love, and that was an easy sew. So those for the, for the Japanese tops that I'm showing are, are easy, super easy. We have enhanced the instructions a bit from the printed version to the digital version. We have filled out the illustrations, added some text, tweaked it a little bit. Didn't do a huge major overhaul of it, but definitely um, added some, some nice instructions for you. Uh, the knits are knit, you know, it's, it's everything from cotton to viscose and, you know, if you're comfortable with knits, you're not going to have any trouble with any of these knits as well. Um, do we have any black rib knit available? I don't know. We might have to check that out and yeah. a link later. I have the feeling we do, but I, I'm not sure. I know we have a deep, deep, deep navy. Uh, we might have black. Um, and somebody also asked about the yardage for the Japanesque, and that's another thing that yeah, uh, we, we can are post kind of that. I think it was two yards. I used two yards for this. I miscut. You know, the sewing gods were not in my favor yesterday. <laughs> By the time I downloaded the pattern and printed it out on eight and a half by 11 sheets. It only took me like 15 minutes to tape it together, but I didn't have any tape. So I had to go to the, to the drugstore to get the tape. So then I did that and, and it still didn't take me any time at all to tape it together. And then I miscut the back, whole other story. And by the time I did that, then I didn't have quite enough fabric for the second yoke. So I have a contrasting yoke in this one, which is fine. So I had to be a little bit creative, uh, but two, I remember cutting off two yards for the probably extra small through about a medium and then maybe two, two and a quarter for sizes above that. That's a 60 inch wide fabric. Can you hold up the, um, the Diva wash or I can't remember exactly what that's called, but yeah, glamorous wash. Yes. Glamorous wash. And it was, a, was it a certain scent? Well, this is Diva. I don't know if Diva is the scent. Oh, okay, I think so. That's what it I might just be. See Samantha's reply. Okay. okay, diva. But there was a couple questions about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, where would I send pictures of an outfit I made from your Cubist print fabric? Mm. Well, you can post it on Facebook on the Sew Along uh, Facebook, or you can send it to Linda at sewingworkshop.com or Betsy at sewingworkshop.com, either one. Betsy's the one who actually posts things. So if you send it to me, it's going to go to Betsy anyway. She's on vacation for a couple of weeks. So if you send something pretty soon, she's probably not going to get to it for a little bit, but, um, she can then post it on Facebook and Instagram if you'd like to do that. Yeah, we love to see pictures. We, some, we many times put things on our gallery as well, on the website. Okay. I don't see any All right. other questions. Okay. So, on sale this week, the new Japanese top digital pattern, the Mix It which is actually three pieces, tank, top, and shirt, printed pattern, the ET, which is a download pattern, and the tutorial called Perfect Corners. Now, in that tutorial, you have how to do the miters in depth. It has all other corners as well, but the miters are in that particular tutorial. So fabric and those four things. I do see a couple questions that popped up. Okay. Uh, the jacquard fabric is 51 inches wide. Do they need the amount for 45 inches wide or 60 inches wide? Uh, always to be sure you go 45 with 51. If it's 54, 55, I can usually go to 60 inch uh, layouts, but uh, for 45 or for 51, is this 51? Is that what we're saying here? 52, boy, that one or looks the other wider ones. than that, doesn't it? Those look narrower because I know the rib knit's pretty narrow. Yeah, but whenever you're converting, that's 49. Yeah, you go to 45, I think, just to be sure. 
Um, can they see how the um, dress form shirt is closed? Like sure. How, what the closures look like on that one? So this is a loop in a button and then the tie that comes out of a buttonhole into the side seam. Okay. Okay. Not to see any new ones. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it, and I will see you next Tuesday.